up with the segment for celebrating the World Mental Health Day 2023. Today, we have with us Ms. Debushmita Sana. Ma'am, we welcome you. We are so glad to have you with us today. It's an honor for us in putting forward a brief introduction about you. Devushmita Madam is an accomplished psychotherapist with a master's degree in clinical psychology from SNDT University. She is certified from the Beck Institute Philadelphia in USA in cognitive behavior therapy. With over an experience of 15 years, she has been into organizations and private practices. She currently serves as the director of Wellbeing Strategies at Mana Wellness. Her exceptional understanding of workplace well-being has prepared her to curate programs such as Wellbeing Ambassadors and Champions for Organizations, along with consulting on well-being policies and strategies. She has nurtured a blend of psychotherapy and workplace well-being in her approach of practice, which has made her a unique resource to any organization looking to improve its employees' mental health and well-being. And we are sure to have a wonderful session with her and gain new perspectives in this field. Thank you, ma'am, once again for being with us. Before we start off, a brief introduction about our organization, the Brunian Foundation, which was established in 2022 January, with its focus on vocational training, employment generation, OBD services, and consultancy. Let me now hand over to Priyanka, our psychologist at the Brunian Foundation, to take the event forward. And once again, a warm welcome to every one of us here present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mubana, ma'am, uh, for being so nice and so warm and so welcoming to all of us. And I welcome once again the Bushmita ma'am with us. And before we begin, I would just like to address one thing. That is, a lot of you have been actually requesting us to conduct our sessions in only Bangla. But the issue is we have participants from all over the nation, even outside the nation. For them, it's impossible to understand any of the regional languages. So what we can do as a part of the team is I can put out some important words or phrases that she mentions during the session so that they can go back and look them up for better understanding. But uh, we would not be able to make the entire session in Bangla or Hindi per se. But you can, of course, ask your questions in any language you're comfortable with so that ma'am can take them up at the end of the session and address them. So uh, ma'am, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's it's very um, it's such an honor to be here. Uh, I have known uh, Deep Ranjani Foundation in layers. I think over the past couple of years, but it's only recently that I understood the full extent of the work they do. And um, honestly, I'm inspired by all of you and especially uh, Dr. Amrita. It's, it's tremendous work that you guys are doing, that you plan to do in the future. So um, it really is quite momentous for me to be here and uh, be able to talk to all of you. Um, I have not had the opportunity to uh, watch any of the previous sessions that uh, have been conducted in this series. So I don't know what expectations there have been set already. But uh, today, what I would like to do is uh, to, to really have a conversation with everybody, right? Because I don't think uh, any of us are really, uh, you know, uh, in a position to lecture each other about anything. So um, it's going to be a discussion, a conversation, and I invite all of you to join in, right? Of course, I'm going to um, be uh, moderating this conversation in a way, giving you prompts and nudges and all of that, right? Um, so are we ready? Everybody is okay with that? I see some cameras on and that is so encouraging. But for everybody else, um, you have to keep encouraging me. You know, that's that's my fuel, right? So I will need your thumbs up. I will need your responses in the chat box. Is that okay with everyone? Great. 
All right, all right. So I'm going to um, share my screen. Just give me one moment. And um, just be prepared to speak. If you want to unmute your mics, I'd be thrilled. Also for the ones who uh, want to hear this in Bangla, Ami Bangali, I would love to speak in uh, Bangla. So I'll keep switching between English and Bangla so that nothing is lost and uh, Priyanka doesn't have to keep translating. Okay. All right. There we go. So I'm going to put this up on the screen. Right. We're going to talk about empathy and self-care today. Right, that's our topic. Um, but before I move on, and you know, we we have um, we deepen this discussion. I want to ask everybody, what do you think about the pictures? Does it seem all right? Does it seem like maybe there's an error? Anyone? See, there are no wrong answers, right? There are I only have, thoughts, and all thoughts are okay. I have an observation, ma'am. Uh, I guess it's the exact opposed. We usually, when we talk about self care, we use, you know, a meditative room and plants and things like that. Hmm. And when we talk about empathy, we usually think about somebody who's there and who, with whom we are empathizing or who's empathizing with us. So, right, right. Thank you for <clears throat> pointing that out. Yes, um, you know, we usually think of empathy in the context of others. It's something that we give to others, right? It's it's a channel for us to connect with others. And when we think of self-care, we think of us. Naturally, that's what's inherent in the terms, right? But I want to challenge this perception a little bit today. So this is a very intentional error, right? I want us to be able to understand empathy in our own context, in the context of the self, and self-care in the context of others. Sounds a little messed up if to go on the guli egalo. Right? Um, it's, I, I think, you know, before we um, talk about empathy and self-care, and the reason I want to start with this is because the why of these two things are very important. Why empathy? Why self-care? Often, um, you know, the, the questions that we get or the, the barriers that we face are that, oh my, I'm so busy, I don't have time for self-care. Um, I want to, there's that intention behavior gap. I want to, but I'm just not able to find the time or, I, you know, my children are taking up most of my free time. Um, I have made all these plans for self-care, but I'm not able to execute it. And for empathy, a lot of times we hear that it is, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot to be able to um, understand others, feel what they are feeling. It's too much to sometimes feel what you are feeling on your own. And then on top of that, feeling what others are feeling is just a lot. I don't have the bandwidth for it. Right? So let's, let's switch these concepts around a little bit. How do you think... Empathy can be about yourself and self-care can be about others. Does this, let's try and make sense of this. And through that, I think we'll find our why. Why are we talking about these things? Anybody? Uh, I think uh, without empathy, uh, this, if, if I'm not... Uh, if I am not uh, taking enough care of myself mm -hmm. or I'm not empathizing with my situations or my conditions or me as a human, mm -hmm. uh, empathizing others will not be possible. So Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be the first step mm -hmm. that I should be empathizing with myself first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that comes uh, again a poor aspect of self-care. So... Mm -hmm. Right. Very old. Yeah. right, right. No, Orbita, you're absolutely right. So yeah. empathy um, is a way of connecting with yourself, understanding yourself, and in the process, um, also understanding others, also connecting with others. 
see every time we connect with others uh, we truly understand somebody else we actually also understand a little bit of ourselves right because everything that you're taking in is kind of being reflected in that mirror of your own mind so understanding others or connecting with others is just another way of connecting with yourself right so that is why empathy is about connecting with yourself and self care i think this one is simpler self care is necessary because you want to take care of others in our roles in our lives as a parent as a partner as a professional um we are required to take care of others is there anybody here who has no need to take care of anybody else in their lives or look after or provide support to others is there anybody raise your hand no right we all have something or someone uh, professionally personally that we have to give to in order to be able to do that we have to look after ourselves because you cannot and you i will emphasize on this you cannot cannot pour from an empty cup but the problem is we feel that our cups are infinite and there is always a point in life where you realize it is not right so before you reach that point you need to start taking care of yourself so that you can continue to play the roles that you play in your life right so that is our why why do we need to talk about empathy and self care because empathy helps connect with yourself and self care helps you give to others okay have i confused you enough are you all still with me how many of you are like eto to boddo beshi bolma hoye gelo ebar jacchi ar pacchi na no all right if this is making sense to you give me a quick uh, thumbs up yeah hearts are welcome to all for sharing love okay great great all right so now um what i'm going to do now because uh, the first part of our conversation is going to be around empathy and um i want to have i want to hold a little exercise um with all of you okay uh is everybody ready do you have pen and paper around you anybody pen and paper even if you have your phone it's fine just something to write on scribble on okay so i am going to show you a picture all right and that picture will have a person in it what we will do now is we will try and um describe what that person's emotions could be like what that person's back story could be like in brief okay very briefly and um i'm going to give you in the chat box a prompt okay so you have the picture and you have the prompt and putting these two together you have to create this person's emotional experience a little bit of a story around it okay and because i don't want us to spend a lot of time doing this i will give you 3 minutes 3 minutes to write the story very brief story you know like those short stories 50 words it's fine right just a short story around that ready everyone okay I will show you the picture in a moment. I'm just putting the prompt in the chat box. here is the prompt and here is your picture and you have 3 minutes okay
very short stories. And once you are done, I would love to hear what you have written. Okay, so what is what does this picture tell you? What is what is she thinking? What is she feeling? Those are some of the things that I want you to think about in your story. You can put the stories in the chat box also. You can scribble it on a piece of paper and then tell me the story once we are done. Okay, it is almost time, just a few more minutes, I'm sorry, a few more uh, seconds, and then we'll share. can see so many responses coming in in the chat box and our time's up okay anybody willing to share and you want to read out what you have written yes i can see somebody is unmuted i don't know who tell us hello yes yes Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Bonastri Deshwarkar. The picture shows us that she is uh, alone, terribly alone. I have written already. Mm. And uh, she, she is reminiscing her past experiences, happy moments. Right. And uh, it also seems that none is there to. Uh, she could share her experiences or details at present. Right. Uh, she needs others companionship at present. Mm -hmm. Most right. most of all helping uh, not only helping hands, but more mm -hmm. more important to her at present companionship. Mm -hmm. To company mm -hmm. her in her experiences, in her day-to-day -day lives. Right. She seems thoughtful. She seems thoughtful. Right. And her looks are telling us that uh, she is um, thinking about something that has gone away, not at present or not in front of her. Uh, okay. The, the experiences have her past experiences. Okay. Okay. She's she's thinking of old times and she's lonely. Yes. And she yes. Has companionship. Yes, yes. She is alone. She is alone. I had a guest chef, a very guest chef. Her hand is on some stick. That mm -hmm. means she is uh, physically a uh, little bit uh, powerless. Little bit. Right, right. There's uh, a sense of helplessness uh, that you see. Yes, um, yes. Thank you. And she needs, thank you. And she needs companionship, hmm. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you for sharing. Okay. Uh, I really appreciate the spirit. Uh, Moduparna, yes, go ahead. You've raised your hand. Uh, a very bright picture. A lot mm -hmm. of light and brightness, mm -hmm. I observe. Mm -hmm. um, I love a beautiful hair, gray mm -hmm. hair. And what comes to my mind immediately I saw the picture was mm -hmm. generativity. There was no um, impression of stagnation. And going through the leaves of albums that she has um, you know gathered over her years mm -hmm. uh, this kind of fragmented and scattered things and um, 
word association came to my mind once I, mm-hmm. I was exposed to this picture. So I find the lady who has uh, who has uh, invited who is enjoying being alone. She's not lonely. She's enjoying being alone, being with herself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's all of now. Okay, thanks, thanks, Madhupurna. Uh, a very different story with the same picture, but amazing. Shrijuni, yes, I can see you've raised your hand, and this is the last story we'll take on this picture, and then we'll move on to the next one. Tell me. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I totally agree with the the last person who spoke. Mm-hmm. Uh, somewhere on uh, looking at this picture, even I feel that she is, uh, you know, recalling the good memories or the good. uh happenings that has uh, she uh, that she has gone through in her life mm-hmm. and exactly as uh, it was said that she what i feel that she is not exactly lonely but being alone she is actually recollecting those happy memories and uh, feel, and having a happy feeling if and thinking that if she could relive those times again something like that right right thank you thank you i love uh, some of the stories that okay. have come in uh, how she is enjoying while other younger women are just you know hustling along i love that i love the spirit but um, thank you for sharing your stories now let's go to the next one are we ready okay so here is the prompt and here is your picture time has started and we have 3 minutes okay just a few more seconds to go sorry sorry about that yeah okay time's almost up anybody willing to share but let's let's do it a little differently this time i want to ask you which one of these uh, situations and images uh, were you able to write sooner which ones first one or the second one where could you start writing sooner where did you need a little more time to think how many of you needed more time for the first one than the second one okay okay and how many of you needed more time for the second one than the first one right yeah okay yeah we we listen to some stories anybody willing to share 
whatever whatever comes up i haven't heard from any of the men in the group i would love to hear you speak you know somebody has to share second one took more time okay there's a mixed response in the group i see that well this was a small experiment that i just um, wanted to try I can see some responses here in the chat box. He's crossed half of the road, but has many more to go. He's, you know, stressed in a nice way. Um, ambitious, empire with a huge smile. He knows he's going to have to face a lot of hurdles. He feels a little unsure. Yes, Orpita, go ahead. Thank you. Uh this uh, picture and the brief is actually uh, we are expecting a very different ceo because his body language and the smile and everything uh, the way he carries himself he's very grounded and humble person uh, who doesn't appear to be a ceo but mm -hmm. uh, uh, he has that thing in him uh, so mm -hmm. i think uh, the company people will be really glad to have him and he must uh, and he's also open to new experiences learning and mm -hmm. uh, there is a certain openness in him in mm -hmm. his overall facial right. expression so maybe he is looking forward to his new wow. learning experiences so he's not that uh, that typical he's not the conventional suited ceo yeah, he's not the conventional ceo yeah. with a that, with so a very where, where they smile but the eyes don't smile right um yeah thank you see uh i wanted so again beautiful interpretations very interesting varied uh, ways everybody has looked at it but i want us to ponder for a second and think about why did it take longer for the one that it took longer if it took you longer for the second picture why did it take longer if it took longer for the first picture why did it take longer well, um, there could be several, you know, there could be a combination of reasons why that might have hop happened. But one of the reasons is that the research around empathy tells us that when we are trying to empathize with somebody, when trying to um, imagine what it must be like to be in their shoes, we are primarily using our experiences as a reference point. Right. So when the moment it becomes difficult to relate to it, if it is not something that is in my range of experiences, I will have difficulty empathizing with that. I can't empathize with a billionaire son because I, I don't know what that life is like. I have he must have very different problems, but I don't know what those are. My problems are very different from his problems. But the old lady, I, I find more familiar. I've seen my grandmother or I've seen my mother-in-law. You know, it's, it's more relatable to me. So maybe that's what happened there. Or maybe it could be the other way around. Maybe you were somebody who was young and ambitious. And you can relate to that better than, um, you know, um, old age. So for several reasons, whatever resonates with our own experience. And when I say experience, it's not just what you have gone through, but what you know of, right? empathy becomes easier and when it's not the other way when it's not that way then empathy is difficult right but along with that does that mean then that we can empathize with certain people certain groups and we cannot empathize with others it doesn't because empathy is not a binary it is not yes no that I can empathize with special children and I cannot empathize with, you know, um, fully abled children. Empathy is in, in shades of gray. So I can empathize more with people with whom I have relatable experience and maybe I can empathize a little less with people where I have no resonance, right? So we are all inherently capable of empathy. It's just that it is easier when it is something that is common, I have something in common, I can understand that better. And it's more difficult when I don't, right? So with that, um, let us try and understand what, when we, you know, we often find confusion between, between empathy and sympathy, or what is empathy like and what it is not and all of that. So again, going back to research that exists around empathy, there are three 
broad elements in empathy. Okay, one is um, the the ability to understand what was what is going on. Like we were all able to understand what that billionaire's life is like. Okay, he is a privileged person. He is ambitious. He has had his own challenges, and you know, he's going to face more challenges. He seems like a new age CEO. We cognitively, intellectually understand it, right? That is also one part of empathy, right? I believe and I understand your experience. The second part is that I can imagine and feel some of the feelings that you might be feeling. Now, this part is often a little challenging if we have no idea what it is like. What is the person feeling? Right? Because um, you, we need more imagination here, which is why it took us more time. It took us a little bit more time, right? To figure out, ki, okay, so I have to use deliberate imagination, right? And then comes the last part of empathy. This, this is a part that we are very familiar with. This is the part which, which, which has um, compassion, which wants to do something, which wants to help others, right? which um, can be summed up by a statement like, I wonder what I can do to share this experience with you, what I can do to make it a little better. The reason I want to uh, keep the language neutral here, I have not written what, how, what can I do to make you feel better or what can I do to make it, you know, make it better is because we don't always have to empathize with misery. We can also empathize with joy. We can also, we must in fact empathize with happiness, you know. Um, I was, in fact, today morning picking up my son from an art class. Okay, He goes to this art class on Sunday morning. It's an art class for like six to ten year old. So they're all, you know, kuchikacha their art class. So, um, and they made this, um, some craft. They, they made uh, a ganpati out of rice, right? And they were all coming out of the class, uh, holding their artwork. And generally, there was a smile on everybody's face. And there was a happy exuberance on everybody's face. And all the parents were just waiting outside the class. Some people on bikes, some people in cars. And I was just watching that scene. Um, one girl comes out, her father's there in the car. And she you, you can see that she wants to show her father the artwork. And she shows the artwork. And he goes, oh, nice, come, come. And she gets inside. There's another boy who comes out. He is holding the artwork in his hand. His father sitting on the bike, serious looking guy. This child does not talk to the father, does not show him anything, just gets on the bike and goes. Right? And I was sitting this, I was sitting and watching this and I realized that that seven-year-old boy knows that his father will not be able to empathize with the joy that he just experienced in making that little rice ganpati. And that broke my heart because we should be able to share joy just as much we are able to share, uh, you know, our, our sadness and our misery. So empathy is not just about empathizing with the misery, empathizing with grief or sadness or loss. It's also about holding space for joy, for exuberance, for excitement, right? And all of this together makes up empathy. So to make it easy, um, I, I, I prefer putting these in statements that start with I rather than nouns or adjectives. So these are actually called cognitive empathy, um, emotional empathy, and compassion. Um, but let's try and remember them in these kind of statements. I believe you and I understand your experience. I can imagine and feel some of what you are feeling. And I wonder how I can share your experience. Are all of you with me? Is this um, making sense? If there are any questions, hold on to those questions and um, we'll come back to them in the last half hour. Making sense? If it is making sense, give me a thumbs up. Okay. All right. So um, we'll do another quick exercise. All right. See, I'm not going to let you um, sit and chill. <laughs> Okay, all right. So we're going to, um, okay, so this is to summarize basically what does empathy need? Empathy, empathy needs intent. Uh, it comes easily 
remember it comes very easily when the experiences are common so it flows out of us it doesn't take effort but if we want to be empathetic consistently then it requires intent to be able to empathize with people who you, whom you do not resonate with at all i'm sure in you know in our line of work for those of you who are uh, working in social impact or you're working in mental health rehabilitation you come across people um whom you feel angry about you know i i regularly have clients who are perpetrators of domestic violence or um once when i was volunteering for um you know juveniles these were adolescents who had committed crimes right and i did not agree with them at all but intent is required for empathy so first is intent two is imagination again we have to really push ourselves to imagine their circumstances imagine their world imagine their feelings imagine or maybe the lack of feelings right and um use our imagination and the third is iteration the reason i say iteration is because empathy uh, actually involves many different parts of our brain it's not one thing when we are uh, doing let's say cognitive uh, empathy where you're trying to understand what that experience is like you're using your frontal cortex when you're using emotional empathy you're using a deeper brain you know so uh, these neural networks need to be developed which is why we need to practice iteration is nothing but repetition so you have to practice empathizing with people whom you resonate with and people you don't resonate with on a regular basis so for fun try empathizing with narendra modi um or uh, you know uh, anyone else for that matter i leave that to you but um, practice right now um moving moving on from here this is the exercise that i was talking about any guesses what this what what is coming up no okay so i want all of you to um find a mirror and if if you don't if you don't have a mirror around you find your phone okay if you've joined from your phone you can minimize this tab it's absolutely fine minimize this tab you can still hear me and open your cameras turn it turn it towards you so it becomes like a mirror okay you can switch off your video that's fine turn the camera around and so that you can see yourself that's the idea right okay once we have done that i want all of us to take a deep breath and just center ourselves right i know there's a lot that's happening we are doing the session people have joined you might have to leave outside maybe it is raining or it's too hot 20000 things that are happening on our in our minds right let's take one breath preferably eyes closed one breath and bring yourself to your center to your heart if one breath does not feel enough take two take three it's all right just bring yourself to your center to your heart okay and now if you look at um if you can't look at the screen it's fine let me tell you these are some things that you need to say to yourself right when you look yourself in the mirror just tell yourself i believe you i understand your experience say it with intent say it like you mean it say it like you're listening to it i can feel what you're feeling and i wonder what i can do to share your experience I wonder what is it that you need today Okay pause pause for a second take another breath 
and find the answer to the last one. Find the answer to what is it that you need today. And when you think you have found the answer, take another deep breath, let a smile unfold and come back. Remember how we started this conversation by saying that empathy is about yourself. It is about connecting with yourself. It goes both ways. If you don't connect with yourself, you will not be able to um, hold empathy for others. And every time you hold empathy for others, that connection with yourself deepens just a little bit. So the iteration part of it is actually very important. But these are some uh, statements and a question for you to hold on to. You know, I don't expect you to be able to fully connect with it right now, for it to resonate even right now. But hold on to these statements, hold on to that question and iterate, come back to it every day to cultivate empathy for yourself and for others and see how they, they enrich each other, right? This is a, such a joyous experience. I can't describe it and you'll know it when you have it. I'm sure you've experienced it already, but to be able to experience it every day is um, such a joy. Right? So um, with that, um, we'll move on and we'll now try to, leading with that last question, what do you need today? Right? We'll now see what, what self-care is. So we've kind of built a premise for self-care, right? Um, self-care is what you do to take care of yourself. But for most of us, the understanding of self-care is actually a little upside down. So what do we usually say? Oof, today I have such a terrible headache. I'm going to sleep early, self-care. That is not self-care, that is self-cure right? Self-care does not happen after you have a headache. It should happen before so that you don't have a headache, right? So self-care, therefore, is basically those little things or big things that you do on a consistent basis for yourself for no apparent reason, just because you need to, because only if you take care of yourself will you be able to give back to others, right? And I'll tell you the importance of this, right? See, normally we are usually coasting along, you know, our lives hit a point of misery or tragedy only so many times in the span of our lifetime. Usually speaking, we are, we are coasting in the average range, most of us. Now, um, when things get really bad, right, self-care becomes self-preservation. But the challenge is that you can't you cannot develop a practice when you are, um, you know, when you are fighting a war. So if the practice exists, it will help you in that war, right? So I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, Viktor Frankl, right? Very famous psychologist, um, psychiatrist, contributed uh, with this amazing book called Man's Search for Mankind. So it's a fantastic book. I'm sure many of you have read it. But one thing that stands out for me in that book is when he was in Auschwitz, he knew his family had been burnt um, alive, gassed to death. He had no hope of like logically, no, no assurance that the war was going to end or that he was going to live. There was very little food, no clothes, uh, freezing, uh, you know, cold. But um, what he would do, and this is what he talks about, what are the things that kept him going? The things that kept him going is um, his ability to make notes, his ability to observe what was happening around him 
and keep his brain alive, keep his mind alive, right? Cognitively to keep himself alive and not sink into despair and misery, right? Now that was cognitive self-care. He was taking care of himself intellectually so that he, he can somehow manage to transcend that inhuman, um, you know, uh, atrocious experience that uh, those camps were. And later on, he talks about how it was those little practices and some imagination that helped him transcend that. And that's what kept him sane. Everybody came out alive. I mean, not everybody. The ones, who, the ones that came out alive um, suffered years and years, right? Trying to recover from that trauma. But the ones who came out alive uh, and in some, some shape to think, were the ones who were somehow able to keep some form of self-care going, right? So that's that's just a little bit of context. Uh, during the pandemic, you know, we saw that people who had um, developed, you know, nurtured practices of self-care were actually more resilient. So self-care is a practice that you develop for yourself, you invest in for yourself because you will need it someday or the other but when you need it you cannot borrow self-care like money from a bank it has to come from within right so um, having said that here is what I would like all of you again questions that you ask yourself what is it that you need today okay what is it what is it that you need every day rather what is what is it that you need every day what is it that you need every week and what is it that you need every month you know, when I ask people the question of self-care, often people say, oh, I want to go on a holiday, but you can't go on a holiday every month. So you'll do self-care only once a year. Puja chujite. That is not possible. Right? That's not, And that's not healthy. That's not recommended. So let's answer these questions for ourselves. Even if you have one lead, one small idea, let's put that down on paper. Okay? We'll take a few minutes to do that. Take two minutes. Think about what is it that you need to do for yourself daily? What is it that you need to do for yourself once a week? And what is it that you need to do for yourself once a month? When you are answering this question or these questions on self-care, think um, of all aspects of your life. Think about, you know, the personal life. Also think about professional life, right? And make sure that your answer spans all areas. I can see responses coming in the chat box. This is such an, such an encouraging audience. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Okay, um, so many of you have already shared in the chat box. Now there's one little thing, one more step that I want you all to take before we close this conversation is, you know, some of the things, especially the daily things that you have mentioned, like something to read, um, something that I want to do for physical health, can they make it very specific? right? Specific in terms of time, in terms of uh, the duration, in terms of what self-care, what kind of thing will you do? How will you do it? Can we make that one thing extremely specific? Like I want to hear an answer. Like I want to wake up at 6.30 in the morning and spend the next 30 minutes doing yoga because I follow this one channel on YouTube and I have a mat already. Right. So something that specific where you know that you have the resources, you have the time to do what you want to do. Right? So make it very specific. Just take maybe another minute to make it very specific. The time bit is very important. Fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, if you think you want to spend more time with anybody, with your parents or with your children, think of what you will do. Again, specificity is the key. What happens by the end of Friday is decision fatigue. You are so exhausted that your brain cannot make decisions anymore. So if you have a decision that's already made for you, you can execute it. But if you have to then sit and think, okay, what do I do now? Chances are it will not get done. So close those decisions. Decide that, okay, I'm going to sit and play Ludo with my children. Or I'm going to go for a walk uh, with my mother. Or I'm going to go have fuchka with my father. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, make it specific. Okay. All right. Now, um, if you have done that already, great. If you haven't, hold that thought in your mind because it is uh, something that I would like you to come back to, okay? As you keep asking this question to yourselves again and again, please come back to specificity, all right? Now, to leave you with, with a little bit of structure because I also, as, as I know that this is all very subjective and sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it becomes a little problematic because we say, okay, to each his own, ja kushi kotte pari. So Jakushi is all right, but it needs a little bit of a structure, right? Uh, so what is that structure? That when we think of self-care, we need to think of three crucial things. One is that it is not just indulgence. Ice cream khilam, uh, ba, uh, at a cinema de khilam, which can be self-care, but self-care has to have a nourishing value. So it is, it, we have to find that balance between indulgence and enriching and self-care should be, you know, eight out of 10 times enriching and two out of 10 times indulgence, right? So more or less a balance, but the overall experience should be nourishing, nourishing to the body, the mind, the soul, whatever, right? Next is it should be balanced. So many of us think that, okay, I, you know, I go for a walk every day, my self-care is done. Or I meditate every day, my self-care is done, right? So physical, emotional, social, spiritual, there are many ways to slice and dice this, but this PESS format is simple enough, right? So make sure that in that, in the daily scheme of things, you're able to do at least one and in a week, you're able to touch all four. Physical, emotional, social, spiritual, balance, right? And self-care, whatever that means to you in all these areas. And lastly, um, your self-care should not cause, um, objectively cause harm to others, right? Um, in fact, if anything, it should add value. So collaborate, find communities, um, find ways to nurture, nourish each, each other, and that just makes self-care even more potent, right? So 
value addition nourishing balanced and it needs to add value it cannot cause harm to others around you right so these are just you know very simple things that i would like you to remember around self care shondipan you've raised your hand go ahead ma'am uh, what about মানে যেমন আমি আমার প্রবলেমটা হচ্ছে আমি খুব একাগিত্ব ভুগি তো এই ক্ষেত্রে মানে আমার প্রতিদিনকার মানে জীবন যাপনে আমার এটা খুব মানে মানে এই এটাকে টেনে নিয়ে যাওয়াটা অনেক প্রবলেম হয়ে যায় মানে আমি কাজকর্ম করছি নিজে পড়াশোনা এগুলো নিয়ে আছি কিন্তু তা সত্ত্বেও যেন আমি অনেক ডিটাচড হয়ে গেছি মানুষের কাছ থেকে আমার বাড়ির আমার তিন চারজন বাড়ির মেম্বার তাদের মধ্যে দুজন অ্যাক্টিভ থাকে তাদের কাজকর্ম নিয়ে থাকে আমি নিজের জায়গাটা নিজের জায়গাতে খুব একাকিত্বে মানে একাকিত্ব থেকে বেরিয়ে একাকিত্ব থেকে বেরিয়ে আমি নিজের পড়াশোনো বা সিনেমা দেখা গান বাজনা এগুলো নিয়ে থাকার চেষ্টা করছি কিন্তু তাও পেরে উঠি না মানে আমার মনে হয় কোথাও মানুষের সাথে ইন্টারাক্ট করা এটা সঙ্গ এটা মধ্যে ইনভলভমেন্ট আমার জন্য খুব প্রয়োজন কিন্তু তাও আমি এর পেরে উঠি না মানে তাই জন্য আমার যেভাবে আমি <laughs> <laughs> uh we have you know we've we've covered a bit of a distance today we've talked about different things i have given you prompts to think about yourself to think about and i know that uh when we think about these things what comes up for us is not always pleasant it is not always something that brings us joy or excitement right so before we close i want all of us to first acknowledge what has come up for you in this session whether it is an emotion it's a memory it's a sensation it's a combination of all of those things what is it that has come up for you if this brings some discomfort um i invite you to stay with that discomfort for a little bit it is okay to to dwell in discomfort knowing that it is it is coming from um some some thought that or some feeling or some memory that you engaged in acknowledge the discomfort acknowledge the emotion and now let us try let us try to move away from it right because we've had this discussion we've understood we've talked we've thought we felt now let us close this conversation right so in your mind in your visualization imagine that you're you're physically closing this closing the book or you're closing the laptop visualize yourself closing okay visualize yourself putting it in a drawer putting the diary or the laptop in a drawer as you put it away in the drawer you close it and you stand up straight and you stretch that spine feel your spine from 
the bottom, the tailbone, slowly going up all the way to your neck. Take a deep breath. Notice how your belly rises, your chest rises as you breathe in and you breathe out. Stay with the breath for another moment. Just notice your breathing and exhale. Notice a smile coming on your face. Notice light coming through your closed eyes. Notice sounds that you can hear me. Close sounds like my voice and distant sounds like traffic, birds. Take your palms together, heart jor kore. Just rub your hands together, rub your hands together and place them on your eyes. One last deep breath, inhale and exhale. I invite you to come back to the session. Okay, so um, we're officially open um, to take questions. Um, Priyanka, is it okay if we lead with Shondipan's question? Sure, ma'am, please. Yeah. So, um, Shondipan, you've asked me a very difficult question, and I will tell you that I don't have an answer to it. But I have a few questions for you that might help you answer the question that you asked yourself. So these are questions for you to reflect on. Um, the first one being, what has caused this disconnect for you? This disconnect, this isolation that you are feeling from people around you, what has caused it? Right? Try and reflect on it. Maybe you will get an answer right away. Maybe you won't. Maybe it will suddenly come to you. That's all right. Just try and think about it. The other thing that I want to ask you is that what is something that you absolutely enjoy doing? It could be a meaningless task. It might have no nothing to do with your ambitions like um, you know, you like to art or you like to dance or whatever it is. Is there something that you really like to do? You like cats or you like dogs or you know, whatever. You like trees. What is the one thing that you like doing? Find that and then know that you're not the only person who likes doing that. There are other people who like doing the same thing. So find other people who share that same enjoy, same joy. They like doing the same thing, right? If you like plants, find other people who like plants. Find other people who have gardens. If you like dogs, find other people who have dogs. And they like dogs and they rescue dogs and they take care of stray dogs, right? So find that. Find the one thing that you feel strongly about that brings you joy and then find other people who do it, right? But having said that, um, if you're feeling like this for um, over two weeks or, um, or longer, I would suggest Shondipan speak to somebody. Speak to a mental health professional. They'll be able to help you deal with what you're dealing with, right? So I hope that helps. Um, any other questions that we have? Um, yes, ma'am. We have some questions from the participants that were sent to us mm -hmm. while they were filling the form up. I'll take them one by one, if that is yeah. okay. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. So, ma'am, a lot of parents have asked that how they can teach their children about empathy and self-care. Hmm. By practicing it. Children don't learn in any other form. They watch and do. Whatever they see, they will do. But also, um, sometimes we do things without explaining it to them. So talk about self-care. Tell them to think about self-care. Before you go to bed, you do your self-care or whatever time you're doing it. Tell them that this is my self-care. Don't disturb me at this time. And then encourage them to do the same thing. 
okay, this is your self-care. We are not going to disturb you at that time. Respect that. So develop this practice of self-care with yourself. Talk about it. And your children will learn. Another common question that a lot of people from various backgrounds have asked that they don't have time for self-care. Mm -hmm. Like they're saying that my office is separate, I'm traveling and then when I come back home, I'm so tired that there is no way I can do something you know, extra for myself. Mm -hmm. So what do you suggest, man? Like how can they manage their schedules and find some time for self-care? Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need to redefine what self-care means. If let's say you have a really packed schedule, then um, ask yourself, what is it that I can really do for myself daily? Ask that question again. You, it may not be, maybe you have decided I want to do 10 minutes or one hour of gym every day. It's just not happening because you logistically you're not able to make it. Redefine that. Your, the answer to your question is wrong then. Ask yourself again, what is it that you can do for your self-care? Maybe the answer is walking to the metro instead of taking an auto every day, right? Or maybe it could be something as simple as not ordering that roll at seven o'clock in the evening because it doesn't agree with me. So revisit that question. Very important. That, and I think the flexibility and the acceptance that this is how my life is, and this is where I have to manage actually answers a lot of things. Uh, Ma'am, another question we have had again for a lot of, uh, from a lot of people that uh, they tend to empathize with a lot of people on daily basis and mm -hmm. they try to be there for other people, hold up spaces for them. But that kind of leads them to a space where they feel empty and drained. Yes. So the, I think that is something that we started with the conversation with that how it's important. So would you please put some light on that again? Absolutely. Um, so while, and you know, this often happens to people who are naturally more empathetic. Everybody wants to draw from that, that well of empathy, leaving you empty. But it also happens because some of these people who are high on empathy um, have a backstory. And that backstory, um, I don't want to label it trauma. I just call it a backstory. It, it puts them in a position where they can't say no. And they also don't take care of themselves, right? Um, so it, it is important if you are uh, one of those people, very high on empathy, willing to help others, it's fantastic. But understand your own story, right? And you will know why, why it, it is the way it is, why you are the way you are, right? Trust me, it's, it's not rocket science at all. It's actually very simple. So when you realize that uh, you are just as human and you are, uh, your energy is limited, you are not born with superpowers, then you will know that uh, you have to have, you also have to find wells from where you can refill. So one is self-care, of course, that you take care of yourself, take a break, take pauses, Two is find those people whom you can lean on. It's very important. Okay. And another thing that, um, you know, I have learned the hard way. This is a lesson I have learned in life. I think all of us who came in the field of mental health or rehabilitation or special education, we did not come for the money, right? Let's all agree we are underpaid. Now, the next question is that why did we come then? Because we came here, something resonates, you know, we came to help others, basically. We came because that helping fills, it helps me fill some holes in my own self, right? Now, um, so I would want to help everybody. Many of us have volunteered in school and college, volunteered for this and for that, and you want to help people, but you cannot help somebody who's not willing to take that help. And sometimes it can be a client and you're, you're trying so hard, they're just not receptive to it. And you have to see it. There is wisdom in noticing that. So it's a hard learned uh, lesson for me that as much as I want to help some people, I just cannot because they won't take it. And when I see that, I leave my you know offer there, take a step back. Because then that trying will only um, burn me out. Right. and take this resource away from someone who actually is willing to use it. So 
different pieces but i hope that answers the question priyanka yes ma'am and i think uh, culturally uh, we have a practice that providing help is a you know good thing to do hmm. asking for help is not it makes yeah. us weak yes. so i think that's also a notion that kind of puts us in a place where we cannot really seek help hmm. but uh, we always provide help so absolutely i think that's also important especially as mental health professionals the barrier is even bigger right oh mm-hmm. i've heard so many times that oh you know you are you should be able to figure it out you are a psychologist okay but i yeah. have blind spots for myself no we all have blind spots for ourselves so important to find that other person that you can person or plural individuals mm-hmm. that you can lean on mm-hmm. and it's not going to be your partner all the time let me also tell you that for the ones who have partners it's not going to be your partner you will have to find other you know mentors um senior you can look up to therapists that you can lean on yeah Sure. Um, uh, we have another question from somebody that how do we identify that you know in the process of empathizing i am not really sympathizing to people how to distinguish between these two that you know what's really happening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um one um rule of thumb is ask yourself do you find that temptation to fix it do you find the temptation to give them some advice that oh do this or do that oh eta ko thik ho jabe are eta korish ni keno so when when that comes up if that's the voice that coming up then check because that's more likely to be sympathy than empathy right um if it is empathy it has a heavier quality to it it usually has a deeper immersive quality to it so then you are not quick to speak you are not quick to give suggestions you're more in a receptive you're more in an absorbing mode right so if you're in a in a mode to give quick answers quick solutions quick advice then that's probably not holistic empathy if you want to understand if you want to absorb if you want to hear then you're probably in the zone of empathy so difficult to tell complex often it's a mixture of both which is okay but since you asked that's i think how i would answer that question right ma'am and uh, what i have observed with like people who are trying to empathize there is also an you know element of pity or this unequalness when it comes to sympathy that i have felt but with empathy we always put the person on the same pedestal it's not that they are we then they don't have pity. yeah so yeah uh, ma'am we have one question from amrita ma'am she wanted to ask about the role of boundary in empathy like where do we think that we have to stop now it's like a lot how yes. do we do yeah so uh, that's i think the most uh, difficult when it comes to empathy and um so i was um, it's actually a, a question that i think we've all struggled with in many different ways and i'll tell you what i heard and that was really helpful for me so i was listening to a podcast and this gentleman he's um i would just say erudite without going too much into the background very well read very wise person and um, what he said is that you know people ask for help all the time like people want to and if you are somebody who can empathize they will constantly want to sort of you know drain that drink from that well which is okay so and that that is a drain for us so what he suggested is that give them uh, the put the ownership on their coat give them something that will make that will require a little effort on their part so when people approach him over phone or you know over text he usually tells them that you know why don't you whatever you're whatever you're going through whatever you want from me you put it in a paragraph and you email it to me and he says that most people don't email so that's one way of uh, putting a boundary in place but uh, and he said that the reason he had that all of us have felt this drain right this energy drain because you're just giving and giving and then you have nothing left to give to yourself or to others right so it's important to realize that our energy is finite and it is important to protect that energy so how do we protect that energy we we ask people to do some of the work if they do it then they are demonstrating intent 
if they do the homework and they come back to you, then you know that, okay, this person really needs something and you help them with the resources that you can. But mm. if they just, you know, don't, then you, you have your boundary in place. And um, the, the, the art of saying no is, um, is absolutely essential. We have to learn the art of saying no without uh, rejecting the person. So often we, we confuse the two, you know, saying no to somebody's request is not rejecting the person. It's just speaking to my uh, capacity at this point to meet your need. Mm. And I may not have that capacity. Practically speaking, what has helped is to have uh, adequate training in what I do, professionally speaking. So the training helps to, uh, you know, meet the needs faster, better, with better structure having supervision, having mentors, because again, they help guide you through these things. It's, you can't do this alone, trust me. Mm. And um, yeah, so, you know, training, supervision, mentorship, these are all things that have helped in uh, maintaining these boundaries because it's difficult to do by, all by yourself. Very true, very true. And uh, somebody had raised a hand. I think they did that mistake. The biggest thing we didn't put that down, but I'll still ask uh, Dave if you can hear me. Question that please, please, uh, you can ask it to us. Achha, ma'am, we have one last question from the audience, uh, the pre registered ones. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one parent uh, uh, within our institute. Mm -hmm. She wanted to ask that how can you know we can uh, let or I don't know how to, how to frame this like teach people or enable people to empathize with our children, uh, people who have special need. Mm -hmm. or adults with special need, how do we, um, uh, you know, just let people know around us that we need to empathize and how do we teach that? Because they're not in our direct contact, they're not our families all the time, uh, but it can be an extensive uh, setup. Mm -hmm. So how, how can we put that up there? Uh, I think, you know, in this case, the barrier becomes people don't know they don't know uh, what life is, what experience is. So um, I, 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 this answer can be, uh, this question can be answered at a micro level where there are people that you actually interact with and to them, telling them um, about the story again and again, telling them about the challenges, about the joys and the, you know, the hardships of living a different life, what it's like. So sharing those one-on-one -on -one accounts, right, in the context of the child that you are raising can be helpful. Um, often teaching people what to do and holding them through a little bit of this is helpful. But at a broader scale, um, I think, uh, you know, more stories being told in in films on social media through all these awareness drives that we do but getting the stories out there is what's going to i think it's what it's going to be like a drop in the ocean when it comes to empathy for marginalized populations mm. right? so we just have to get more stories out there and we, we have to do it collaboratively we have to do it collectively no one person should have to do it especially the one who's already raising a child it's too much for them. It's too much of a burden to do this and that. So I think the ones who are not, we are the ones who carry the responsibility to get that, get the stories out. Very true. Very true. Um, I have just received one question in my inbox. Um, that is, you know, just to just to sort of um, drive that point in. Look at the change the movie Tare Zameen Par brought. Absolutely. Right? Popular movie, nobody, I mean, how many people in India knew about the condition even before that? Right? And that one movie changed was a game changer. People at least know, okay, they may not understand the whole spectrum and, you know, the nuance of it, but at least something they understand. Right? And that's, and that's a start. And Amrita Ma'am keeps talking about it. Like how, I don't know, both fortunate and unfortunate we are that we needed the movie to put this yeah. out there. Yeah. And um, so ma'am, another question we have got that is, you know, this inertia that we feel that I am constantly trying to empathize, but there is uh, nobody else that I'm getting that I can lean on. 
So basically, this free, again, the state of helplessness is, I think, that they're come putting it out that uh, they're trying, but they're unable to empathize, but they're unable to put themselves away from the situation. Hmm. So, how do they stop? That is what they're asking now. Stop which part? Stop Stopping, trying to hear. Because uh, <laughs> it's possibly at a state, I mean, what I could understand from the question was they are possibly at a stage where they are feeling that it's too much, it's just not happening. Hmm. And uh, they just feel that the other person doesn't deserve it. Hmm. So, so um, see, you can't teach somebody empathy who does not want to learn. Empathy can be learned to some extent. Um, certain empathy in certain specific ways can also be learned. But you can't teach somebody who doesn't want to learn. So you have to recognize that. If a person around you, a family member, a loved one is not willing to learn empathy, then you're wasting your time there find a way to fill your well there isn't one well in the world right find people communities where you connect where you find resonance where people have the same experiences as you do and you will find empathy right it's just i think we we keep looking at one person or one you know group maybe yeah yeah, yeah the partner the parents if it's not coming from there just find um, another source and it's okay it happens, you know, when, when we go through this, it feels um, like, you know, why is this happening to me? Um, if you are in India, you're in Bengal, chances are it's intergenerational trauma. Chances are it's because of partition, and I'm not even exaggerating, right? Partition robbed an entire generation of the ability to connect with themselves. And we are children of that, the children of that generation. Our parents don't know how to empathize. It's, you know, it's our reality. But... Um, what do we do? Find other sources. Find other sources. There have been people who've been able to break away from that intergenerational curse. So find other sources. Make it your mission to find other sources and you will find them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two more minutes. I, can, I think we can take one or two more questions. If anybody wants to ask something, please raise your hand. We'll unmute you. You can ask it or you can type it out, whatever you want. <clears throat> um, may I, Priyanka, take um, one little liberty here? Yes, please. You know, one of the things that I often see nowadays is um, while we try to teach our children empathy and self-care, um, maybe we are not adequately teaching them how to empathize with us, us the parents or the grandparents because um that's that's the that's the home team right that's the team that's always there your parents and grandparents and siblings are people you're seeing all the time so that's a good place to start have the parents empathize with the children um whatever you know range of ability they might have but we have we can empathize with, with each other and also have the children, to whatever degree possible, empathize with the parents. Mm. And how can we do that? See, we see our children um, as complete beings, right? Because we've known them from the start. We know all aspects of their life. But mm. you'd be surprised that children don't see us as the complete person. They only see us as the mother or the father or, you know, whatever area they are they are interacting with. They don't know that you know, that maybe um, I wanted to be a dancer or that um, I've had a boyfriend before I got married. They don't know these things about me, right? And if mm -hmm. you don't know a person, you cannot empathize with that person. So for parents to bring their whole self to the child also, age appropriate measures, uh, definitely, like the professional front, the fact that you're ambitious, the fact that you like riding a motorbike better more than a car. These are mm -hmm. things that your children don't know about you. Right? So talk about your experiences, talk about your life, talk about your dreams, hopes, ambitions, disappointments, challenges, and they will hear you. Their view of you will become more comprehensive and they will learn how to empathize with you. But those three questions, you know, we have to practice those questions, those three categories. Um, I believe you, I understand you, I'm trying to feel it, I'm trying to feel what you're trying to feel. Mm -hmm. 
and what can I do to share your experience? Right? But share your stories as well. Like we don't have a burden of becoming a perfect parent or a perfect teacher. I mean, uh, again, again, there are no perfect parents. It. Yeah, that perfection is a trap. So there is no way to put our foot on that. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, we just got one more question. We'll just take this question last, then we'll wrap it up. So uh, she's asking that um, if somebody is in need of empathy and her immediate environment leaves it, the significant environment rather lacks it, mm -hmm. how to stay by one's own self? Like how to, uh, you know, just depend on your own abilities and sail through? Oh, that's a tough one. But why are we asking this question? Why do we, why do we have to depend only on ourselves and sail through? Agreed. Okay. Important question. It is, it is natural to lean on others. You're biologically wired to lean on others. Um, there's a nerve, you know, that, that is tuned into human, fre vo human voice frequency, which sends messages of safety to the brain when you hear another human voice talking to you in a certain tone. Human touch generates oxytocin. So why do we have to do it alone? When you are wired to do it with others, right? Um, it's very difficult to do this alone. Don't don't do that. Don't try to do it all by yourself. Even the ones that you know, when we feel we are we are all by ourselves, we had people who stood by us. It may not have been my father, my husband, my mother, but we've had people who've stood by us. You know, it could have been a therapist, a mentor, a teacher, a cousin, an aunt. You've not been alone and you are not alone. So find those people. Find those pockets. Yeah. I know this this doesn't um, immediately resonate, <laughs> but let it let it settle. And I think there are some harder truths, ma'am. I think that needs to be said out and uh, maybe we don't understand them then and there, but eventually we do. And it's all right. To just put it out yeah I, I don't know like uh, we're at the end of the session and I have so many topics I want to hear from you I want to hear you speak on assertiveness I want to hear you speak on caregiver distress um, so uh, and I'm feeling so calm and I mean I, I'm just so thankful and grateful for your presence today ma'am so uh, I'm literally out of words so I would not take it any forward I would request Amita ma'am to take it up from here please Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Navushmita, as ever, uh, I think this session has touched uh, the deepest core of the participants today. And uh, uh, simple thanks is not enough. Lots of love to you and very warm regards from the deepest corner of our heart. And this is something so the experience that we had for last one and a half hours, it's not just a webinar, it's, it's such an experiential journey. I think we all of us had that journey with you to, uh, today. And uh, that was incredible. Uh, so as Priyanka said, uh, we would love you to come back with many more such topics. Thank you for being who you are. Always so lovely, so poised, and so thoughtful, and so grounded. Uh, so we will see you soon. And when you are in Kolkata, we would love to have you here for in-person sessions. I'm sure everybody will be happy to do that. Uh, thank you so much, Devushmita. And thank you to this wonderful group of participants. We had almost 74 participants today. And that's an incredible uh, engagement, the way they responded, the way they did their work and the, the way they uh, put up the messages and everything. It's incredible. We will continue with this. Uh, this is the Mental Health Awareness Month celebration that we are doing over the quarter that is September, October, and November. We will continue with the series. The next series will be coming up on 7th of 
October, that is just before the Mental Health Awareness Day. And thank you, a very, uh, very sincere thanks to the wonderful Deepranjani team for making it happen, for making it happen so seamlessly. We are proud of you and we continue to be proud of you because of your wonderful work and your dedication for the cause. Thank you once again, Deboshmita. Uh, we will love to see you back soon, very soon. I'd be honored to be back. See, my heart's beating faster. Just deeply grateful. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you.